Welcome everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for the Garrison Institute Pathways to Planetary Health Forum. I'm Jonathan Rose, the co-founder of the Garrison Institute. Before we begin today's sessions, just a few logistical items about our gathering. We're in a Zoom webinar, so participant audio and video, that means yours, will remain off during the seminar. Please address any questions to the Q&A box below, and I actually watch them throughout the discussion, and we will try and include them in the conversation. We're recording these sessions, and you'll have a chance to review the recordings and share them with your friends, um, as well as a schedule of updated programs at uh, garrisoninstitute.org. This is an interactive online event, which is part of our Pathways to Planetary Health uh, Forum Spring 2022 series. And in this, we are exploring our four pathways to planetary health, which are half Earth, ecological civilization, regenerative economics, and the common good. <coughs> Today's discussion is focused on the third pathway, regenerative economics, and the challenging of uh, and challenging conventional economics and exploring a new economic paradigm, which is required if we're going to achieve planetary health. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our guest, Eric Beinhacker. Eric is a professor of public policy and practice at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. He's also the executive director of the Institute for New Economic Thinking at University Oxford's Martin School. INET, Oxford is a research center devoted to applying leading edge interdisciplinary approaches to the issues including financial system stability, innovation and growth, economic inequality, and environmental sustainability. He's also a supernary fellow of economics at the Oriel College, an external professor at the amazing Santa Fe Institute, a visiting professor of economics and public policy at the Central European University in Budapest. Um, he had an 18 year career at McKinsey, where he was a partner in charge of strategy and climate. Um, and he's the author of the most amazing book, The Origin of Wealth, The Radical Remaking of Economics and What It Means for Business and Society. And he's writing another amazing book right now with Nick Hanauer. Eric, welcome to the show. Well, and thanks very much, um, uh, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be with you and always a pleasure to participate in a Garrison event. Thank you. So Eric has actually been part of an earlier program of ours called uh, the Climate Mind and Behavior Discussions. And uh, so we've had a long, um, uh, we've, we've spent a lot of time together and it's been really quite wonderful. So Eric, you know what I thought was it'd be great for people to get a better sense of your background. So maybe um, start with how did you get to the Santa Fe Institute? Because that's, and maybe even talk a little bit about what the Santa Fe Institute does because it has a complexity theory, a different way of thinking about things and how that influenced your thinking about economics. Um, sure, well, I, I guess I'd start by saying that uh, I sort of did my career backwards. Um, you know, lots of people start in academia and then make their way into the business world. I started in the business world and made my way uh, into academia. And uh, one of the things I discovered in, in you know, my business experience at McKinsey and also as, as a venture capitalist before that, was that the real world looked nothing like what was in my economics textbooks. Uh, I'd studied economics as an undergraduate in that graduate school. And um, that huge disconnect between the theory and, and reality uh, troubled me for quite a long time. And then uh, eventually um, uh, I made my way out to the Santa Fe Institute um, where there was this amazing collection of not just economists, but physicists, biologists, anthropologists, um, uh, all kinds of psychologists, all kinds of people from different disciplines who had a radically different take on how the economy worked. Um, they saw it as a, an evolving uh, complex system, much more akin to a, a biological system than the very mechanical views in economics textbooks. And uh, that kind of rocked my world and, and you know, showed me a path for actually trying to develop an economics that describes reality. And that makes, you know, by the way, reality, what's so interesting is physics and biology are reality. They actually are the nature of reality and systems are systems. So, um, so to maybe describe, uh, give an example of an old way of thinking versus a new economic way of thinking. Well, the you know, uh, traditional sort of econ 101 um, way of looking at the economy for a very long time has been uh, this very mechanistic view that you know humans are these kind of Spock-like, you know, rational 
creatures just purely trying to maximize their own pleasure and, and self-interest who are engaging in arm's length transactions in this mysterious thing called markets. Uh, and then these markets uh, mysteriously aggregate that activity into a beautiful um, uh, equilibrium point that is you know, balanced and optimal for people and uh, society with you know, no, no messiness and no frictions in it. Um, and um, uh, you know, economists for a long time have kind of analyzed the real world as a set of exceptions to that idealized uh, uh, picture in, in the textbooks. The, you know, the, the newer thinking, uh, which was uh, pioneered at the Santa Fe Institute, but has been then developed uh, by quite a number of institutions, including ours over the, uh, the decades since, um, looks at the economy as made of real people. Um, you know, people who can be both, uh, can be selfish, but can also be highly cooperative and altruistic and uh, engage with each other in a rich uh, set of ways and have multiple goals and needs and desires and that those complex interactions um, create institutions and organizations and cultures and uh, technologies and all of those things are also evolving and changing all the time and create this environment that we call the economy. And then zooming up to look at it as a system, uh, this complex evolving uh, system of, of real human beings looks a lot more like an ecology uh, than a machine in that it's uh, you know, constantly uh, changing and is very dynamic uh, uh, over, over time. And one could never say that it's optimal in, in, in any sense, but it is quite you know, effective and ingenious in the innovations it produces and um, uh, you know, the ways it can change uh, over, over time. You know, I remember you once giving me an example um, which was after the global financial crisis of modeling, I think in the Washington, greater Washington area, you, um, something called agent-based modeling, whereas instead of modeling these overall systems, you actually say, what if we had a million people or 200,000 people who are applying for mortgages? And then you try different, you apply different mortgage policies um, and you saw what was the policy that actually crashed the system and what is the policy that could have actually avoided a crash and through, running tens of thousands or maybe even hundred thousand different iterations doing all these slightly changes but with these uh agents who are like real people you could actually figure out a solution that actually worked yeah so um you know one way to characterize this new way of thinking of the economy is it's really from the bottom up instead of the top down um you know that we start with you know individual people and 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 then uh, the networks they create and the institutions and organizations that they're in and then the markets that they form and so on and building up to this thing we call the economy versus more traditional methods that start with these kind of big aggregate variables you know gdp income house prices you know uh whatever is of, of interest and then try to try to work down and um this uh new way of doing things um uh, enables us to use all the advances in computing power and, uh, and data that we've had over the, the past couple of decades to some, some real effect. So we can uh, create models like the one you were describing, these uh, agent-based models, um, that quite realistically and granu granularly can, can model these systems from the bottom up. And then they provide kind of a, a laboratory, a flight simulator uh, that allows you to explore uh, you know these worlds and ask okay you know what if we did something different would we have gotten a financial crisis or housing bubble or you know what if we did this and maybe it makes it worse and um, and we think that those kind of um, tools uh, could be uh, very useful for uh, for policymakers and, and also for businesses too so I just want to pick up another point that you made also because um because there's a moral element to there's a there's a cultural and moral element to this, and you mentioned cooperation. So E. O. Wilson wrote a book called The Social Conquest of the Earth, and in it he said the reason why humans are the most powerful species is because we collaborate and we cooperate and we actually do things, and that actually, whereas if you put two people up against each other in a fight, the strongest is going to win. But if you put two groups up to against to compete against each other, the group in which everybody in the group is working together people who cooperate the best are actually going to win. And that there's a huge competitive advantage to cooperation, which also means not being selfish. It means being altruistic. 
And so we've constructed this myth of an economy that's all about survival of the fittest and the strongest wins and the markets go to the one with the most money and blah, blah, blah. When it actually turns out that the way civilizations and culture work is the ones who are the most altruistic and collaborative and take care of the poor, those are the ones who win. Yeah, exactly. And, and um, uh, E.O. Wilson's Social Conquest of Earth is also one of my favorite books. And everyone listening, if you haven't read it, uh, please, please buy it and read it. It's, a, it's an amazing book. Um, and, um, you know, just as you, you described, uh, Jonathan, um, you know, we've had this myth of, of the economy being built by this kind of atomistic, asocial, amoral, you know, uh, market competition. But the reality is, um, not just the economy, but all of civilization is constructed out of, of cooperation. Um, you know, it's cooperation that creates, um, you know, the global supply chains that feed and clothe us, that create the amazing technologies like the, you know, phones in our pockets, uh, you know, that, um, you know, build all of the stuff of, of, of modern life. Um, and, um, uh, you know, just as you say that, you know, we have these deep cooperative instincts we also, you know, can be occasionally selfish or, you know, jerk sometimes. That's just part of human nature too. Um, but um, uh, things like uh, moral norms and institutions and culture have evolved to help us kind of harness our better angels as much as we can, and also tamp down and, and restrain, uh, you know, the, the the negative stuff. And this is an insight, actually, that uh, Adam Smith um, uh, wrote a very deep book about the theory of moral sentiments. And it's kind of popularly assumed that Adam Smith was the father of greed is good, you know, because of the invisible hand. That's actually a myth, by the way, promulgated by Milton Friedman, not by Adam Smith himself. Um, and, you know, the reality is, is, you know, he understood that um, you know, this, the secret of a successful economy and society is, is harnessing these, you know, these moral instincts and, and, and our better angels toward cooperation. And that's what good institutions do, you know, good laws, government, uh, you know, good cultural norms and, 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 and so on, you know, provide the, you know, the lubricants and, and security and confidence that enable us to cooperate at scale, to do what uh, Paul Seabright, uh, an economist calls, cooperate with strangers. Um, and, um, uh, you know, societies that fail to have those kind of good institutions or have, you know, highly individualistic, untrusting cultures uh, cannot achieve cooperation at scale and are inevitably uh, poorer. And one of the tragic things of, of the past decades and the economic ideology we've had is that by promoting this kind of hyper individualism and this myth that greed is good has actually uh, been like kind of acid on those, you know, uh, on those, uh, uh, on that culture and, and uh, those uh, connections and has reduced our ability as a society to cooperate. And in, in addition to all the other negative things, over time that will make us poorer. So interesting, Rebecca Solnit wrote a book called A Paradise Built in Hell. And what the book posits is that when really bad things happen, this that's like visceral and emotion together. So she just describes, for example, the 1906 earthquake and then fire in San Francisco and how spontaneously all these people who had <clears throat> gone there for the gold rush and they were there to exploit and all that stuff, but spontaneously built uh, refugee camps in the middle of the streets and food kitchens and fed everybody and everybody was incredibly generous. So here's the question for you now. In some ways, we are seeing the battle between total arrogant that it's all about power and cooperative societal cooperation beginning to play out in Ukraine. So, what do you think? Well, I think it, it, it's just a, a, a tragic uh, example. Um, you know, I, th I think you're right. Uh, you know, we're seeing this, you know, very top-down, brutal, you know, authoritarian regime uh, taking on a society that's now, you know, organizing itself from the bottom up in, in some quite amazing ways to both uh, fight back and uh, to also provide help and aid, you know, for people. Uh, the stories of all the work, you know, getting those two million refugees out of the dangerous situation are, you know, both heartbreaking and, and inspiring. And then also seeing, um, you know, what's happening in, um, 
uh, you know, Poland and other countries where, you know, just average uh, citizens have, have really rallied around this and, you know, organized these incredible networks to, to help and uh, support uh, people. Um, I heard an interview with a, uh, a Polish grandmother on the television who was saying uh, Polish grandmothers don't have uh, much money, but they have big hearts and uh, that they were, you know, organizing to welcome these, you know, this huge flood of people into their homes. But it's also, it's unfortunate it took this, but I feel like it's organizing Europe and it's organizing the world in a way to gather around a moral force in a way that we have not seen. Now, what we have not seen the world do, I mean, so the immediacy of like this crisis seems to motivate us. How do we harness this same sense of collaboration to deal with uh, climate change and particularly a sense of duty of care to the next generation? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question and, and, and one that's been uh, very much on my mind too, because, um, you know, just, just as you say, we see how an immediate crisis can, you know, bring these cooperative instincts to the fore. I mean, we kind of intuitively know that, you know, the best way to, you know, uh, fight this evil is through coming uh, t together. Um, uh, that's a very deep instinct. Um, but we haven't seen that in, in, in climate change because it's it's a you know its nature its nature is is a kind of a it feels like a slow burn problem even though in the time scales of the earth it's an extremely you know fast <laughs> happening uh, problem and it feels dispersed you know a, a natural disaster here a food crisis there a water shortage there you know it's hard for people to see these things connected together as as a a, a, a common uh, challenge. The, you know, the one thing that uh, I've, I've thought of that, you know, can help trigger those, um, you know, those deep seated emotions is this duty of care for, you know, for future generations and a real kind of moral imperative uh, around that. And if, if people are interested, I think there's a link in, in the chat on a piece I wrote called I'm a carbon abolitionist, which, which noted that, um, the one thing the climate movement is, you know, has been largely treated as kind of a dry technocratic issue, you know, of scientists and policymakers and business people and so on. But what's been missing is a real sense of a social movement. And all social movements have a moral argument at their core, um, you know, whether it was abolition of slavery uh, or, uh, you know, uh, gender or sexual rights or uh, any number of you know other uh, social movements that we've seen you know rise to you know a uh, real mass level, and you know that's been lacking in in the climate debate. We haven't actually you know harnessed people's moral emotions and particularly this you know care and concern for uh, for future generations enough. And you know uh, that's kind of what Greta Thunberg showed us uh, you know through catalyzing the. Uh, the you know the the school uh, protest was that you know that uh, you know that feeling is is very uh, is is very real. Yeah, um, you mentioned uh, several times you mentioned about bottom up, but you also wrote in addition to your climate abolitionist article, you wrote an article about middle out. So talk to us about middle out too. Yeah, um, <clears throat> well. Uh, uh, um, for those who, who might have listened to President Biden's uh, State of the Union address a few weeks ago, you might have heard him talk about that the economy doesn't grow uh, through trickle down. Uh, it grows through middle, middle out, bottom up and, and, and middle out. Um, uh, that phrasing actually came from uh, my co-author Nick Hanauer in a book that he wrote a number of years ago and some ideas that we've uh, developed since um, that, the, you know, the, uh, you know we, we've had for decades, this kind of neoliberal idea that, you know, by providing uh, tax cuts to rich people and, you know, support for, uh, for, for capital, uh, that that would, and deregulation for business, that that would stimulate, you know, investment and growth and, and expand the pie and the benefits of that would then trickle down to the rest of society. Well, we've had a few decades of that experiment and the evidence is in that it, it doesn't work. And in fact, it's been very, very damaging that um, uh, incomes from the middle down ha haven't grown. They've actually stagnated or even, even declined and people have become much less economically secure. Social mobility has decreased. And, you know, we've also seen a rise in, um, you know, uh, uh, illnesses and social, uh, 
problems and, and all kinds of other things that uh, go, go with that. Um, and you know, we argue in this, this new piece in, in, uh, in democracy, sort of explaining the background on the middle out idea that it is actually by um, uh, investing in you know, the broad population to you know, create the security and opportunities to get that cooperative engine going uh, and enable people to participate in the economy. And that an inclusive economy, that inclusion is actually what creates uh, prosperity. This is really important because what you're talking about is everything you described are not terms always that ec economists use, but that there's inequality, that there's lack of poor health, there's lack of well-being, that people are unhappy, people are dissatisfied, that we have a society that's not working for people as much. Those are really, really critical factors that we should be designing. You know, so. Uh, the Fed supposedly has two jobs to make sure that unemployment is low and that interest rates are low. Um, but you just listed a whole bunch of other things which may be really more important about the quality of life and we don't seem to be designing for that. Yeah, no, exactly. And, we, and, we, and even more bizarrely, um, you, know, uh, sort of, um, you know, economic theory for many decades and, and the kind of economic ideology that gets translated into politics and policy have had this idea that there's a trade-off between kind of people and the economy. You right. know, you can either have people have a good life or you can have a, you know, rich growing economy, you know, you choose. And there was actually a famous book in the 1970s among economists called The Big Trade-Off, said you can have either equity or growth, but, but not, uh, not both. And, you know, it's a, it's a kind of strange inversion, you know, that, that um, you know, people serve the economy instead of the other way around. And so part of what Middle Out argues is we need to flip that logic on, on its head and, and you know, see the economy as trying to you know, serve the interests of people, try to support flourishing lives. And you know, what makes a flourishing you know, life is, is very multidimensional. It includes things like you know, health and um, you know, uh, freedom and social relations and community um, and um, uh, political voice and and you know feelings of, of you know what uh, the philosopher Elizabeth Anderson calls democratic equality that we all have a you know kind of equal worth and 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 say in the system, um, and uh, you know for you know for decades the economists would say if you're interested in those things go go talk to the political science department or the psychology department or the you know sociology department we just maximize this thing called GDP. And uh, you know that's not working out so well. So we we really do need this, you know, integrative perspective of thinking. You know, what kind of an economy supports human flourishing broadly, and non-human flourishing. Right. Um, so I just want to take this a little further because, and uh, we have a question, uh, a multi-part question. But the first part is about donut economics from Kate Rollworth and. Mm -hmm. What Kate says is that very poor societies need to grow enough of an economy to have the resources to deal with all the things you've just described. But if when wealthy societies keep growing, we end up over polluting and, you know, and, and exceeding our planetary boundaries and creating all kinds of negative impacts. So um, I've noticed that even that across the board in many different conversations, we keep talking about economic growth as a good. And I guess my question is, uh, I forgot how many trillion dollars the U. I think the is the, how many trillion dollars is the global economy? Is it one hundred and ten trillion or something? I can't remember. Uh, no, it's it's uh, you you you've kind of uh, stumped me for a second, but I think it's on the it's more on the order of ten or something like that. Uh, no, no. I, it, when I last okay, yeah. it's not you know we can we can but look anyway, it up but anyway. Whatever the the take the American economy. Yeah. Is growth really what's necessary, or is is the equalization of opportunity what's necessary within it? Yeah. Um, well, first I should I should mention, and the person asked about donut economics. I'm a huge fan of of, of Kate Rowland's work. She's an Oxford uh, colleague, um, and uh, I, I can say I had the pleasure of actually uh, seeing the donut for in one of its earliest iterations. We were at a, a workshop together, and she sketched this thing out on a graph and said, I had this idea, this, you know, two circles and things. And, and you know, it's been phenomenal how she's um, used that to really capture this need to integrate 
um, you know, that we do need a healthy, thriving society that has, you know, material wealth, but also all these other things too, with, you know, within the planetary boundaries, a safe operating space uh, for, uh, for humanity. And, you know, that the developing world um, has had, you know, the worst deal imaginable that, you know, us in the, in the developed world have thrown all this stuff up into the atmosphere and into the ecosystems. And most of the damage from that is, is having, you know, the most, you know, um, uh, direct effect on, on, on people in the developing world who haven't even benefited from the, you know, material prosperity that created. So, um, uh, you know, um, the question, you know, for all countries uh, isn't growth in the, in the conventional sense of just more stuff, more consumption, you know, which is essentially what GDP measures. But I like to think about it as <clears throat> progress. We don't necessarily want growth, but we do want progress. Right. And um, I, I think, you know, for folks who, you know, um, and, and, you know, I, I want to be careful not to mischaracterize, uh, you know, uh, uh, folks in what's called the degrowth movement. But there is a, you know, sometimes an idea that we can kind of, you know, you know, stop the train and just sort of redistribute and make things right. more fair and kind of, you know, live off the existing, you know, uh, stuff we have. And, you know, that's, that's neither, you know, realistic for a whole host of, you know, political reasons. Um, but it also doesn't address uh, this kind of natural drive, you know, that humans have for progress, for making life better, uh, and you know, for innovating and, and and developing, and you know, and 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 that drive is, you know, uh, in in the very much in in the you know emerging economies as as well, and and shouldn't be denied. But we have to rethink what progress means. That it doesn't just mean more stuff um, it means better ways of of doing things better way uh, better ways of meeting the needs that we all have what my co-author nick hanauer and i call solutions to human problems right it is by solving human problems you know how do we feed ourselves how do we shelter get transport entertain ourselves get information um, that you know we can answer those questions solve those problems in better and worse ways and what we want are better ways and better ways means good solutions to the problems, but also not creating this huge damage to the ecosystem that we're doing. So, by the way, I just quickly googled the um, global economy is ninety four trillion. Ninety four, yeah. And so you were you were you were you were very close, Jonathan. In in twenty twenty one, and um, so it seems to me like that's a lot. Yeah. And um, uh, I was in a conversation yesterday with Stuart Wallace, who said we don't need to think. We shouldn't be thinking about redistribution which means taxes and you know taking money from some people and giving it to another but actually what are the systems that are pre-distributive so what are the systems that actually create that well-being and shit? i totally believe that we need to engage engage i'm an entrepreneur and we and people we need to engage people to entrepreneurially be challenged to kind of uh, solve the well-being issues of our time and of all of our people and for all of our species but is there a way to do it uh, and I like this idea that, you know, have somebody go make a bunch of money and then tax it doesn't feel as good as having a different kind of system in which people, um, uh, the Arab has a firm, the wonderful engineering firm has a, a phrase for its employees of reasonable prosperity. They say that everybody deserves reasonable prosperity. So is there a system where in which we all achieve reasonable prosperity, but by making the world a better place? Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, this is obviously a, a, a huge, huge question. Um, one, one way that um, uh, I, you know, try to enter that question <clears throat> is, you know, examining, you know, how, how does this look from, you know, the perspective of different kinds of individuals uh, in, in society? And, and, you know, one, one way of, of looking at that is saying what, what people want are, uh, what I call fair social contracts. Um, it turns out our psychology, uh, that, that um, what psychologists have found is actually, <clears throat> we don't particularly so much care about equality as we care about fairness. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> and they're not the same thing. <clears throat> and, you know, you can illustrate this with a very simple uh, example. If 
Um, you know, if you and I, Jonathan, were in a running race against Usain Bolt and the outcome was equal, you think the game was rigged. <laughs> you know, you expect an unfair out. Well, you expect, sorry, you expect an unequal outcome because right. he's you know, the fastest man in the world and we're not. Um, and so a fair outcome is one in, which is highly unequal. Whereas if, you know, we're all sort of flipping coins and Jonathan, you know, you get all, you know, all heads all the time, then something's fishy. And we think that's an unfair game because we would expect an equal outcome. So a quality or inequality is kind of a, can be a signal of fairness or unfairness, depending on the game we're playing. But what we really want is whatever game it is we're playing to be fair. And fairness has a number of dimensions to it, including things like reciprocity. You know, if I'm contributing into the game, I expect something to come, you know, back out of it. Um, inclusiveness. Uh, I mean, if I'm not admitted from the game, if I'm excluded from the game, you know, um, uh, and we have, you know, lots of sources of exclusion in society from, you know, racial and, 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 and gender and, and, and uh, uh, class and power and other things. If people are excluded from the game, they're not going to think it's fair. Um, that there is some notion of merit. You know, if I play the game and I'm a good player at it, I should do well. And if I'm not, you know, I shouldn't do well. So let's, you know, uh, Usain Bolt should be the winner of our running race. Um, and, but also we know that, you know, um, uh, not everyone is born with the same opportunities. And so there's also, you know, a fair game involves, you know, some development of capabilities and, and helping people, you know, overcome challenges. And then finally, also notions of security that, you know, if, if um, I have trouble in the game through no fault of my own, through bad luck or, or what have you, that, you know, there's some mechanisms to, you know, um, uh, uh, help me out. And so, you know, if we think about fair social contracts, that then gives us a, a lens to look at, you know, uh, things from, you know, labor relations to racial justice laws, to um, uh, you know, things like uh, you know, uh, how wages are paid, um, uh, to corporate responsibility, all kinds of, of, of issues. It gives us a lens for evaluating you know, whether the, the contracts with society are, are, are fair or not. And you know, we argue that by having fair social contracts, that's what maximizes cooperation and inclusion, and that leads to prosperity uh, creation. I totally agree. So I just want to review this. Mm -hmm. By the way, we know that what's so interesting is these characteristics you've de described, we know that we are neurologically wired for, that that's how the human brain actually thinks. So you said- Yeah, and we should be careful to say it's not, it's not sort of you know, deterministic that we're just yeah. biological machines, but we have the, you know, these instincts, exactly. you know, natural instincts for it. And so again, we want our institutions and arrangements and, and, and culture to kind of you know, harness that good stuff in us and also, you know, tamp down on, on the bad stuff we all have or the occasional, you know, jerks and sociopaths out there. So you said fairness, merit, reciprocity, security. Um, what else? Was there another characteristic? Uh, and, and capabilities is <clears throat> another <clears throat> important one. You know, I also read a, um, a study of uh, primates that said, that in their actions, basically that, that tamping thing, you know, we also all do need discipline. We need to, you know, we actually need to be as part of how societies work is punishing the person who contradicts the norms. And uh, a study showed that the ideal ratio was something like nine good things for one bad thing. Like there's one reprimand for like, for, and, you know, nine positive things. And that, that kind of seemed to create the right balance. Yeah, now there have been some interesting studies on that that show that actually, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, antisocial behavior is pretty rare. But because we're so tuned into it, we're, we're constantly scanning and watching for it. And, you know, uh, again, part of enforcing, you know, uh, or, you know, enabling cooperation in society is, that, you know, sort of uh, keeping that from getting out of hand, that we're so tuned to it that it kind of lights up parts of our brains and, and we get feelings of moral outrage and it, it's much more kind of visible and salient than the than the nine you know uh good generous you know cooperative altruistic reciprocal things that were going on uh, at the same time so are there societies now or in history 
that actually have these characteristics, this fairness, merit, reciprocity, capability, you know, supporting capabilities, providing security. Well, uh, I, I'd say, you know, no, no society, you know, is, is perfect. Um, every society, uh, you know, has its problems and its, um, and its, its uh, you know, limitations. I'd say, you know, the, you know, the U.S., um, uh, you know, for many parts of its history has done a better job than most countries uh, in that with a huge caveat around it. The fair social contracts were largely reserved for white males, right? And you know, uh, the you know both the you know the, the big tragedy of American history, and then also a you know a more hopeful story has been expanding that circle of fair social contracts and inclusion, um, uh, you know, to all people uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, over time. And um, uh, there was a, a, a very good uh, a uh, book uh, written, I think it's by Jim Tankersley, who uh, shows pretty good evidence that the kind of this golden age of inclusive economic growth from the post-war period up until the, the 70s, a large part of that was the result of increasing participation, you know, by people of color and, 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 and women, uh, and this growing circle of inclusion, you know, extending the fair social contracts in, in society. Um, but, you know, I, I, again, uh, we then started to go backwards on that and the social contracts became steadily less fair, you know, with the kind of neoliberal takeover that started in the, in the 1980s and has continued until uh, recently. Um, and that um, deterioration of fairness and loss of fair social ranges has been a huge fuel for populism, uh, you know, in, in the U.S. You know, if we look around the world at societies today that do a pretty good job of this, you know, uh, one would have to point to, you know, the Nordic countries, uh, which, you know, have uh, pretty good, pretty fair social contracts, New Zealand, uh, and, and, and a few others. Uh, sadly, it's, it's probably a pretty short list. Mm. I do want to challenge a little bit the, the, the fairness of the post-war period, because, for example, we expanded the interstate highway system dramatically. And, uh, and we tended to put the interstate highway system through communities of color, the poorest communities, because those are the ones with the least political power. So if you think about if American wealth is created by home ownership, <clears throat> then those um, highways took you to suburbs like Levittown that originally were not racially, you know, had racial covenants against uh, blacks moving in. And so you were investing infrastructure actually in simultaneously destroying the value of somebody's home in a city and creating opportunities that were not equal. Uh, um, so there is, I do, so I think if we're going to move our societies towards this greater fairness, which is, and I think fairness really is the key thing. And I bet you, if you really went across from the left to the right of political spectrum, what everybody really wants is fairness. But then we do have to look at the structural issues that are creating unfairness and walk up to them. Uh, 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 absolutely, and, and you know, uh, and you name some very, you know, very specific ones, um, you know, that uh, uh, have to be still still have to be uh, addressed. Uh, and you're right, you know, um, there is pretty good evidence that uh, fairness, uh, you know, is something that cuts across the political spectrum. And you know, when you look at um, you know, the, the grievance politics of, of someone like Donald Trump or some of the populists right. in, in Europe, um, what they're largely doing is pressing people's, you know, violations of fairness uh, buttons. Right. Now, you know, they're doing it in a very divisive way and then, you know, pitting one group against another and saying the reason why things are unfair is because somebody else has done this to you, you know, uh, immigrants, people of color, foreigners, you know, whatever, uh, you know, group they're, they're targeting. And, you know, so, uh, you know, the, the challenge to both building a prosperous economy and healing our politics is to, um, you know, create fairness in a highly inclusive uh, way. Right. Um, okay, so I'm going to shift totally. This is an Oxford question. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson popularized the idea of the carbon coin uh, in his book, The Ministry of the Future. And now Oxford seems to be doing something about this. So, uh, the questioner would love to hear your thoughts on this. 
Yeah, no, the, um, well, I, I'd say, um, uh, you know, first of all, uh, Sand's book, The Ministry for the Future is, is uh, you know, another uh, must read, um, you know, uh, it's a uh, science fiction book, but it, you know, like all good fiction, it sort of casts a real, you know, spotlight on, on, uh, on real life and, and uh, um, you know, uh, is very thought provoking uh, with regard to the climate problem. And in the, in the book, you know, one of the um, uh, things that saves us is this intervention by central banks to create a uh, kind of quantitative easing for the environment to create, you know, what he, he calls a, a carbon coin. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, and, you know, there's a, a number of scholars, uh, including at Oxford, that are exploring, you know, how the monetary system and how central banks, um, you know, could do something to, you know, trigger the kind of massive investment uh, required to address the climate issue. And also in, in, in uh, Stan's book, um, uh, they also use it to buy out the bad guys. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, that's also not crazy that in, in, you know, periods of big social change, the status quo has a lot of money and power. And sometimes the only way to uh, get, get rid of them is to, you know, basically pay them off as, as, as morally challenging as that may be. Pragmatically, it may you know, sometimes is, is, is what's necessary. Um, now, uh, you know, so it's an interesting intellectual exercise to pursue. Now, I'm, I'm personally skeptical about whether central banks could ever play such a role. Um, you know, they are very restricted politically in their mandates, you know, watched very closely by lots of political interests and their cultures tend to be quite sort of, you know, technocratic, you know, stay in our lane. Um, and, you know, the, the tendency has been to see climate change as an issue that needs to be solved by the political system. Um, and, you know, um, uh, their role is a narrow one of, of things like, you know, evaluating climate risk for the financial system that might be seen as a, as a legitimate part of their mandate, but intervening in, in a much broader way, you know, would, would not be. Right. Um, so somebody asks, so people may want fairness, yet it seems to me that when it means to altering how they live, they're more resistant. Um, so what are your thoughts? How do you, <clears throat> how do we move towards fairness, but, you know, also have people have a sense of stability in their lives? Yeah, so, you know, we, you know, we all have, uh, you know, these tensions between, you know, our self-interest and, and, and even selfishness and, you know, the, the interests of others. And, you know, we're, um, you know, most disposed to um, uh, sacrifice our self-interest for others, you know, to our family and, and, and close friends and, and people close in our social circle. That's, you know, quite well established and, and intuitive. Um, but when, you know, uh, when we have, you know, kind of fair structures and systems that we can trust around us, you know, then we're able to, you know, stretch and um, in, engage with, with others, um, you know, in, in quite uh, significant, you know, significant ways, um, you know, we'll, um, you know, if we think that the system is fair, you know, we're willing to pay our taxes to, you know, a, a, a reasonable degree. Now, people will have different views on what a reasonable degree is, and that's what political systems are for, to, you know, find some, some compromise uh, among, amongst the diversity of, of views. Um, so, um, you know, uh, fairness and, and trust are kind of quite closely linked. You know, one of, one of the reasons why the U.S., you know, uh, and, and other countries, you, you feel like this sort of, um, you know, uh, individuality is, is growing and, and kind of, you know, uh, the circle of fairness is shrinking is because trust in the system is low. You know, the feeling is if I contribute to the system, if I stretch, if I'm generous, others won't reciprocate or others will take advantage of me. People will free ride and, and so on. And, you know, um, you know, the media certainly doesn't help with that because one of the things that, 
you know, gets likes on social media and news stories and so on is, is stories that trigger our moral outrage buttons. Uh, there's a wonderful psychologist at Yale, Molly Crockett, who's done a lot of research on this. And so seeing all these stories about how people are taking advantage of us, cheating, you know, violating the rules and so on, you know, makes us kind of shrink, shrink down um, to, you know, protect our, protect ourselves and our, you know, family and friends and narrow, narrow interests. So it's, it's a real challenge to, you know, rebuild uh, those bonds of trust in institutions and, and you know, um, and, and uh, uh, you know, expand the circle of inclusion and fairness back out. Yes, and it even gets harder when we think about the global north and south, because yeah. of, let's talk about climate justice, because in the global south, not only has it, it had to absorb all the impact of the climate, but then fairly recently, one of the cops or Paris, I think we made all these pledges about the money we're gonna to bring to the global south. That was only a couple of years ago and we didn't do any, we didn't do what we pledged. Yeah. So how do you, how do we actually build faith and fairness in, in between the global north and the global south? Yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, and uh, we're kind of seeing an illustration of that with the, the Ukraine crisis, you know, there's also a lot of psychological evidence that humans are tribal creatures, um, that we tend to trust those like us the most and be fair with people like us the most. And, um, you know, and, and people kind of define their circle or their tribe on all kinds of dimensions, including some, you know, very destructive ones like, you know, race or uh, ethnicity or religion and, 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 and so on. Um, and, you know, um, on, on the one hand, you know, the Ukraine crisis, the response of the, you know, West of the Ukraine crisis has been very heartwarming, you know, seeing this huge welcome, lots of countries are giving to Ukrainian refugees, but that didn't happen to the Syrian refugees or the Afghani refugees or, you know, uh, refugees coming from Africa. Uh, it was a very different kind of reaction. And, you know, one, you know, one can see that it was because they weren't like, you know, like us, meaning people in the in the global north and and um, uh, west. So you know um, that uh, that sort of exposes the kind of scale of challenge in creating this kind of feeling of common humanity. Um, uh, you know, across the global north and south, that, that's really going to be needed to to address these issues. Um, you know, I I, I I wish I had a good answer on that, but, you know, uh, I think we can see the scale of the challenge. It's a big challenge. It's a big challenge. And in fact, if we're going to get through the many crises in front of us, we have to figure out how we build, uh, how we become a trusting species across the multiple layers. One element, so in my company, we have a value called excellence with kindness. You know, we live in a world today where people think that being excellent means being tough or being, you know, I don't know, but being tough. And our question is, can you actually uh, be compassionate and can you be kind? Can you expect excellence from others, but actually be kind? And there's a question here about, is it possible for kindness to actually be a lubricant or a, a key function, a quality of, of business? Yeah, I think, you know, I, th I think it can be. And, and, um, uh, you know, it, it's often easy to sort of, you know, paint business in negative lights and so on. But actually, one of the great accomplishments of global businesses has been in creating global cultures of, of trust, um, you know, that span, um, you know, huge numbers of company, uh, countries, north and south, different cultures, different ethnicities, different religions, and, and, and so on. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, many of these Global firms have been very successful in, in creating, you know, somebody comes to a meeting from, you know, America, Europe, Africa, India, you know, Asia, and so on. And, and you know, they're all together, you know, working on the same project, you know, with the same goals, trusting each other, communicating each other. And there's kind of a, you know, cultural overlay uh, that's supporting that. So in some ways, it is a bit of a, you know, existence proof. Um, that cultures and institutions can be created that can, you know, can bring, you know, expand the circle of, of trust and inclusion, you know, across all these dimensions that we tend to 
tribalize on. Um, so, you know, we uh, now, you know, uh, we should find ways to do that and harness that not just for, you know, making money and building global supply chains and, you know, uh, you know, creating amazing technologies and up as important uh, as all that is to, you know, to our material lives, but find ways to, to harness that, you know, uh, for these other goals of environmental sustainability and social justice. Right. In your uh, Middle Out article, you say, we think of inclusion as the golden rule of economics. The more people contributing to an economy and benefiting from it in fair social contracts, the more prosperous we all are. And research shows that people's perception of what is fair uh, maximizes buy-in to the system. So um, there's another question which has to do with, so, you know, we're having such a hard travel problem with getting with uh, people believing in facts and evidence that, you know, people seem to be so emotional and, you know, I, and, and it feels to me, so I wanted your thoughts on this, that there's some key, so we really aren't rational beings. We like to pretend we're rational, but we're not. So therefore, um, some of us think we're buying, uh, paying attention to facts and following facts, but we're following the facts that we choose. And so what I like about this idea of the golden rule of economics is it kind of creates a system that people can believe in, and then from that maybe be more accepting of the facts of it. Mm. Well, um, uh, it, it, in my uh, list of recommended books, I'll add another one, uh, the, the Enigma of Reason, um, which is a modern, a wonderful summary of a lot of modern cognitive science. Um, it says that we're, you know, we're most definitely not rational beings, uh, but it doesn't mean we're just, you know, sort of irrational and emotional or, or random in our behaviors. But rather, uh, they have a nice metaphor. They say, uh, we're not scientists, we're more like lawyers. Um, that, you know, we have a set of kind of intuitive beliefs that do stem from our emotional and, and, and social instincts. And then we tend to use facts and, and data to construct our side of the story and our argument for you know, what we kind of much more intuitively believe. Um, and you know, uh, if you listen to an anti-vaxxer, uh, they will produce all kinds of you know, supposed facts and evidence, even though you know, much of it may simply be made up stuff on the internet or, or what have you. Uh, but they, you know, they will try to muster a, you know, a, a fact-based logical argument for their position. Um, you know, but again, it's it's a position that they're taking for other deeper emotional reasons, and and often lack of trust uh, in the in, in you know in the system um, uh, that they're doing it for. And you know, um, we, we all do this in in different you know in different ways. Now, there's a a, a big um, uh, the big breakthrough of the Enlightenment though was to create institutions that could harness this kind of you know, competition of, of narratives to reality. And so what science does is, you know, a group of scientists have competing narratives, competing hypotheses, what they, you know, uh, think is, is, is right about a problem, and then has a process for actually comparing that, you know, to reality, to empirical evidence. Um, the law, you know, when courts and justice systems work right, they also create a competition of narratives and, and facts and reality, and then try to, you know, resolve that against whatever, you know, truth uh, they can, you know, the closest to the truth we can get. You know, the media, uh, you know, when it works well, should be doing that. Social media does, does not do that. Um, and in a way, markets also do that uh, when you think about it. They're kind of these evolutionary competitions of different, you know, hypotheses tested against, you know, some, uh, some economic reality. Now, um, uh, you know, so um, when, you know, when these institutions, you know, work well, um, you know, they actually kind of keep us harnessed to, to reality, to the real world. But, you know, when, when they break down, um, you can get these huge deviations, you know, conspiracy theories, you know, the kind of stuff we're seeing with anti-vaxxers. Um, the kind of you know propaganda lies that the Putin regime are putting out in Russia and so on, and it's no coincidence that you know uh, dictators and want to be dictators attack these institutions. They you know attack science, democracy, the legal system. You know they in essence try to untether us from reality 
and you know uh, create a you know a, a false reality that serves their their interests. Uh, we're gonna, I, we're getting close to the end. Um, so there's a really interesting question here, which I'm going to paraphrase, uh, but I would say it's about religious value systems. Um, and uh, it says much has made in science, much has been made in science circles that the modern economic growth is due to Judeo-Christian values of the Reformation and a broader distribution of the Holy Spirit. Um, so, uh, the um, there is, so the, I think the real question is, is there a way, um, you know, um, I'm trying to think of the right phrase. His Holiness the Dalai Lama came up with a phrase, um, something ethics, I'm liking on the phrase, but it was basically non-denominational ethics or is non you know, can we have uh, ethics without religion? Can we have, can we actually find a way to a higher moral system without, um, um, involving some spiritual element underneath it. And um, so that's what I'd love to hear your thoughts on. Yeah, he, he, well, called it eth he called it ethics for the new millennium. As, 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 as usual, the, the Dalai Lama is, is incredibly insightful. Um, you know, I, I, one way I characterize it is, you know, that there are, you know, certain um, kind of ethical principles that are, you know, tried and true and proven to you know, foster uh, cooperation, trust, inclusion, and all these things that then enable us to cooperate at scale, you know, and create both material prosperity and, and healthy societies. Um, you know, the golden rule uh, mm -hmm. is, is one example, do unto others. And, you know, um, uh, most religious, uh, you know, faiths have some version of that, you know, that's been sort of, that, that kind of, you know, what, the philosopher Dan Dennett would call it a sort of evolutionary trick, uh, you know, has been independently discovered by all kinds of, uh, you know, faith communities um, and, and, and also other cultural communities of, of, of maybe of no faith too. Um, so these things are not, you know, particular to any one, you know, religious group or, or you know, cultural uh, group, but they're available to, to all of us. Um, and, 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 you know, one way to think of faith communities is they are these storehouses of kind of, you know, of all wisdom, um, you know, over many millennia. Now, they also have their own historical peculiarities and yes. you know, some things that create conflict and, and, and other things, too. Um, but, you know, we can, as the Dalai Lama is, is you know, I think, suggesting, you know, look across them and, and, and find these, um, you know, set, uh, you know, set of values that, um, uh, appeal to our intuitive uh, moral instincts and can, you know, help us, you know, flourish as the cooperative species that we are. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to give everybody a reference. There's an amazing group called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, we-all.com, I think, or maybe .org. Um, and, um, and these are economies that are actually trying to take these ideas and put them into practice. We all are stuck with outdated systems and tax codes and, and infrastructure. There's a whole lot, you know, you can't just, we can shift our ideas and then we, it takes a long time to shift the systems underneath it. But, um, but the, the, world, the world of economic thinking is changing and the practices on the ground are changing too. So I guess my last question to you is where else do you see the practice on the ground changing? Um, well, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the thing that, uh, keeps me in, encouraged is, um, you know, that there, there are lots and lots of experiments going on out there, you know, different ways of doing business, different ways of doing agriculture, different ways of organizing communities, new technologies, uh, being, uh, developed. Um, uh, you know, new ways of, of, of organizing the economy. Um, you know, the, the question is, can we break free, you know, from, uh, you know, from the old ideas to give the space and support, you know, for, uh, for the new ideas to flourish and achieve the, uh, you know, the scale um, uh, that, that we need. Um, you know, uh, I, I can't remember whether it was Einstein or somebody else who, there's a wonderful quote about that, you know, it, it's not, it, the real challenge isn't so much coming up with new ideas, it's breaking free uh, from, mm -hmm. from the old ones. And, uh, 
uh, that's to a large extent, you know, where we are. Well, thank you for joining us and may your ideas and the work of INET and your colleagues and your new book when it comes out all help us break free of the old ideas and, and plant the seeds of the new ones. Uh, thanks so much, Jonathan. It's a, it's a pleasure. And uh, again, congratulations on all the great work Garrison is doing. Well, thank you. And it's great to see you. I'll see you next week. <laughs> all right. Bye.